about right. Well, thank you, Mark. I'm we're probably much more interesting if we talked about our Trek experience, but um, that's, that was a few years ago. A couple more people are wandering in. I, I have to admit, when I looked at the schedule and I saw that I'm competing against, and let me, let's see, the Utah Department of Health COVID-19 response, I figured that I would get a few people who were just really sick and tired of COVID, <laughs> and my mother, <laughs> who, yes, is sitting there in the back. And um, so I almost didn't prepare anything, but then I thought my mother would be really embarrassed if I, if I didn't actually have a talk pre prepared. So. It, a total shifting of gears here to talk about abdominal infections. But I, I think it's important and there's actually a lot of interesting things and data that have come out in the last five, six years that um, to really shed a lot of light and give us a lot of help in terms of managing abdominal infections. I noticed that uh, a number of the speakers talked about conflict of interest. and I don't have a conflict of interest slide, so I'll just tell you that I probably don't have any conflict of interest except to say that most of my children have been educated because of abdominal infections. And I'm reminded, I, when I was a resident at, at Johns Hopkins seemingly forever ago, there was a very famous one of the, uh, he, was, he was a plastic surgery attending and one of those who'd been around for decades. And, and the residents used to say, you know, that the plastic surgeons abuse the antibiotics probably more than anybody. And Dr. Manson's response to that was, you know, the infectious disease doctors say that we don't need to give antibiotics in situation X or situation Y or whatever abuse they were doing. But then he would say, but they only get paid when there's an infection. Sounds like a conflict of interest to me. So for whatever that's worth. The, um, my only other conflict of interest would be, and this is just a, a, just a real interest. Um, for the, those of you who know me well, we are still playing Ultimate Frisbee every Saturday morning <laughs> at the uh, church in Shadow Valley. And anybody who wants to join in, see me afterwards and I can get you on the list. There are several people here who have participated and will tell you that it is great fun. So anyway, I've stalled long enough. I think everybody has come in. We'll talk about uh, the management of abdominal infections from a surgical perspective, but also kind of a historical perspective. Uh, it was fun to see that, um, to see Dr. Reese talk about the uh, HIV epidemic that began in 1981. It was fun to see the uh, the two lecturers talk about syphilis going back to 1494 and some of those other pandemics. So I'm going to talk about abdominal infections that beginning at least 3,000 years ago. And this is the first really well-recorded abdominal infection. And if you, you can read it in Judges chapter 3 in the Old Testament. It's Ehud versus King Eglon. And uh, some of the verses here are terrific. The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite. Or, and he was, importantly, left-handed. And by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab, but Ehud made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit in length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. And he brought the president to Eglon, the king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offering the present, he said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. And Ehud came unto him and was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat, and Ehud put forth his left hand, 
and took the dagger from his right hip. Clearly, they'd only searched his left hip because they expect him to be right-handed. <clears throat> and he thrust it into the king's belly. And the haft also went in after the blade. The detail in the story is really incredible. And the fat closed upon the blade and so that he couldn't draw it out. And the most importantly, the Bible records, and the dirt came out. And thus we see the very first clearly described colon injury with resultant peritonitis and death. So we've come a long way since that, I think. From prehistory down to King Eglon and beyond, to our knowledge, there have been hundreds of thousands of people inflicted with perforating bowel injuries who died of infection or hemorrhage with very few survivors. But interestingly, Hippocrates um, talked about that, he talked about small intestine and bladder injuries and colon injuries, and he said, interestingly enough, that small intestine and bladder injuries were more deadly than colon injuries, which from a bacteriologic standpoint makes no sense. But I thought about this, not that it really matters today, but I've thought about this, and, and perhaps those few patients who actually lived for a few days after their colon or small intestine injury, perhaps the fluid and electrolyte problems associated with a small bowel injury were, were caused death more quickly than the uh, colon injury. I don't know. It's an interesting thought. Anyway, Celsus, who wrote two books about medicine in an eight-volume encyclopedia in the first century, he wrote about intestinal injury, and this is really fascinating. Sometimes the abdomen is penetrated by a stab of some sort, and it follows that the intestines roll out. When this happens, we must first examine whether they are uninjured, and then whether their proper color persists. The larger intestine can be sutured, not with any certain assurance, but because a doubtful hope is preferable to certain despair, which makes me think of the, of the COVID treatments that were tried out at the beginning of the pandemic. It occasionally heals up. Then if either intestine is livid or pallid or black, in which case there is necessarily no sensation, all medical aid is vain. Another very good observation. And it talks about the wound is too narrow, you need to cut it sufficiently wide. If the intestines have already become too dry, they are to be bathed with water. And these are all great common, I mean, modern surgical principles. Next, the assistant should gently separate the margins of the wound by means of his hands, which is terrific. That's why I have students to retract the wound so that I can do my work. And then the stitching of the surfaces of the skin in two layers, and finally, the, they talk about uh, setting the stitches together because they can be broken down more easily by the abdominal movement. So that is an absolutely fascinating description of treating a bowel injury in the first century. And there is a book, probably in Latin, of uh, Celsus's writings, and if you look at the very bottom there, I think it's published in 1747 or something like that. So moving ahead in terms of history, um, Galen described performing operations for intestinal and abdominal wall injuries, including suturing in gladiators, but no record of the mortality rates exist, and I suspect they were pretty high. And uh, Matthias Gottfried Pormann was a German army surgeon. He was known most for trying to do blood transfusions from animals to bleeding soldiers. It did not work very well, but he was more successful and if, if the documentation is true, actually did an intestinal injury repair in 1675. And I promise I will eventually get to modern infections, but some of this is so interesting, I, I have to just bring it up. The um, Dr. Abraham Vodder, after whom the ampulla of Vodder is named, reported in 1720 on a patient named George Depp who was injured at the Battle of Romilly's in 1706. He had a left colon injury that went in through the left flank, and apparently, very remarkably, the colon protruded and became its own ostomy. <laughs> 
And if you see his description there, the wounded and protruded intestine is inverted, and being united in the middle, it exhibits two orifices. The upper orifice communicating with the small intestine and discharging the alvine feces. I have no idea what alvine means. And the lower orifice with the rectum so that a clyster, I presume that's an enema, injected per the anus is returned by it. So essentially, George Depp's body taught us how to obtain source control and prevent deadly abdominal infections following injury. And there's this really cool picture. So you can see that it, this is a side view, and that is his ostomy, for which he lived at least, or with which he lived at least 14 years. My daughter is a wound care and ostomy nurse at McKay Hospital, and she was fascinated by this story, just so you know. Other notable abdominal infections, um, Queen Caroline, who was the wife of King George II, died in 1736, 10 days after developing a strangulated umbilical hernia. And then eventually, small intestinal contents started to flow out of there, and she passed away a few days later. Um, British surgeon had a patient who ruptured her abdominal wall, and he removed the gangrenous portion of prolapsed intestine and left an umbilical enterostomy. And that patient survived for many years. Um, the first planned colostomy was a cecostomy. It was done in 1776 for malignant bowel obstruction by a French surgeon. But interestingly, they had treated the patient with mercury before they did the surgery. And the patient died a couple of weeks later. And when they did an autopsy, what they found was two pounds of mercury in the patient's intestines. And the ostomy actually did fine. This was interesting, too. In 1793, a left inguinal colostomy was done by a French surgeon in an infant with cloacal atresia, and that patient lived 45 years. And then a French surgeon reviewed all the published cases of colostomy from 1716 to 1839. He noted 27 cases, 21 deaths, and a mortality rate of 78%. So World War I produced the first catastrophically large-scale, well-studied series of bowel injuries and associated abdominal sepsis. Cuthbert Wallace, who was a British surgeon, wrote up a series of almost 1,300 such injuries in 1917. He noted that the mortality rates were about 80%. Most of those would be non-operative. It was still even debated whether to try to operate on these patients uh, in the early days of World War I. Um, he did note that it was possible to have spontaneous recovery after perforation of abdominal viscera, but pretty darn rare. But he also reported on about 1,000 patients who had laparotomies and various repairs and ostomies and noted that the mortality was down to just barely over 50%, which is a remarkable improvement. And in fact, in 1943, in the middle of World War II, the U.S. Surgeon General mandated, in fact, made it a court martialable offense to not do a colostomy in the face of a colon injury in battle. And the comment, and I was afraid of this. So as much as I hate to tell our IT person, our IT person, <laughs> these are, I, I, the, there's a new set of slides that we just loaded on, and this is the old set. The new set doesn't have any blank pages. I hope. Yeah. Sorry about that. <coughs> I told Teresa, but I forgot to tell you. Oh, that's okay. Okay. Yeah, see this, I put the animation on. We won't review all of this. I'll just flip through this really fast. No, 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 it's not your fault. I submitted to Teresa a set of slides because she really wanted one, and, but I wasn't quite done when I did it, so I brought my, so anyway. My kids would tell me that, that I violated my own rule, where I often say that procrastination is the great career killer. And um, so, yeah, I procrastinated a few of these slides. Okay, so we're on target here. The treatment of colon injuries is based on the known insecurity of suture and the dangers of leakage, and that's still true today. Uh, 
Simple closure of a wound of the colon, however small, is unwarranted. Men have survived such an operation, but others have died who would still be alive had they fallen into the hands of a surgeon with less optimism and more sense, which is a, is a fascinating description. Um, injured segments must either be exteriorized or functionally excluded by a proximal colostomy. And the mortality of colon injuries in World War II was only 5 to 20 percent, which is really amazing. Of interest, it wasn't until 1991 that we actually had randomized controlled trials proving that you can do a primary anastomosis following colon injury in most circumstances, and uh, which is the standard of care today unless the patient has, is, is really an extremis. Anyway, Promise's talk is about abdominal infections and not just about fun colon injuries, although colon injuries are a great source of abdominal infections. And in many ways, the theme of this is going to be less is more. So we're going to talk about appendicitis, diverticulitis, abdominal sepsis with abscesses, post-surgical abdominal infections, abdominal infections and inflammatory bowel disease, and yes, I couldn't resist COVID-19 and abdominal conflict complications and infections. So appendicitis. Sorry, I couldn't miss, I couldn't help myself. I, got, I was really into history here. So in 1735, Dr. Amiand removed an inflamed appendix in a right inguinal hernia. And to this day, an Amiand's hernia, and I love quizzing the students on this, is a hernia where the appendix is incarcerated in the hernia sac. The first actual planned appendectomy for appendicitis was in 1880. And there's about a quarter of a million appendectomies in the United States each year. About 7% of all Americans will get appendicitis, but this is an interesting statistic. About 15% of all Americans will get an appendectomy. Many of those are incidental. Um, some are taken out because we made the diagnosis wrong. And um, anyway, that's kind of an interesting statistic. So I'm sure there are people here from the old days if there isn't, there's my dad is here in, who personifies the old days, but he will tell you that when he was a surgical intern at George Washington University back in the, was it the 1860s or 1960s? <laughs> anyway, he will tell you that appendicitis was an emergency. In fact, many of you probably learned that appendicitis was an emergency, that if you didn't get the appendix out, that it was going to burst and the patient would die. Um, interestingly, that's no longer true. At back then, middle of the night appendectomies were common. In fact, when I was a surgical intern, that was one of the few things good about taking call is that occasionally you would get the opportunity to, to take out an appendix. But then everything changed. We found out that if you got an appendiceal abscess, you didn't operate on it, you drained it. And if you had a big appendiceal phlegmon, you just gave antibiotics because surgery in those situations caused more harm than good. Now we wait until the next morning to do an appendectomy, which is terrific for one's lifestyle. I suspect that uh, the surgeons of long ago would be rolling over in their graves to think that we didn't get out of bed to do an appendectomy immediately. Um, the, uh, and so data has started to come out that you can even just give antibiotics and the appendicitis will get better. The first data came from Navy personnel where they simply didn't have the ability to operate on them right away and they would do okay with, with, uh, ap with antibiotics. Interestingly, I can't help but spend, or since we talk about Navy personnel, I have one more historical thing to tell you. There is a fascinating story and it's well documented that on a submarine, the USS Grayback, cruising underwater in 1942, a young pharmacist mate did an appendectomy on a patient, one of the submariners who had appendicitis. And with sort of makeshift tools and the, the old bending the spoons back to be your retractors. And um, the story is well documented. And in fact, the person who did that eventually became an administrator at Primary Children's Hospital.
has since passed away, but that's a true story. So notwithstanding that we would go to extraordinary means to get the appendix out back in the day, nowadays we'll wait till morning, give antibiotics, and so on. So Europe really has been at the forefront of demonstrating that antibiotics will treat appendicitis. And depending on which data you look at, the, the success rate is anywhere from 50 to 90 percent. But they also showed that, or the data show that recurrence is common, anywhere from 10 to 30 percent in the next year or so. And this data was well summarized in a New England Journal article back in 2015. There's very little American data. I did find that in UCLA they randomized 30 patients, which is not a very big randomized trial. The antibiotic-only patients had fewer complications than surgical patients, but the recurrence rate at 12 months was 13 percent. Uh, there was a retrospective review done at Stanford. It, we looked at 58,000 patients, but only, but less than 5 percent were treated with antibiotics. The other, all, the others all had surgery. They noted a 4 percent recurrence rate in a fairly short period of follow-up, but the costs, interestingly, were identical. So it is actually true. You can treat appendicitis with antibiotics, you'll get clinical resolution 90% of the time. But there, and the data are also very clear that there's no increased risk of complications by trying antibiotics first, meaning abscesses, perforation, and so on. But the recurrence rates are substantial. So interestingly, when all this data came out, I, for a while, asked my patients, would you rather have antibiotics or surgery? Well, this is the United States of America where we pretty much always choose the more invasive option, which is an interesting phenomenon, and everybody's laughing because they know I'm telling the truth. It was very difficult, and I didn't try, I shouldn't say it that way, because it's not like I pushed people to not have surgery, but if I just asked the question, at least 95% said, well, I definitely want surgery. If there's any chance that this is gonna come back, I definitely want surgery, which is fine. And I pretty much stopped asking the patients what they want to do unless they bring it up first. But I have had a few patients that where I used antibiotics as a bridge. And I remember one specifically, it was a Friday afternoon, they were in the emergency department, they had appendicitis, they weren't dying from it. And I talked to them and they said, you know, I've got something really important going on this weekend. I don't know what it was. Can we just get through the weekend and maybe do this on Monday? And I said, sure. And so gave them antibiotics, probably Augmentin, and they made it through their weekend plans, and um, they had their appendix out on Monday, and they did, did perfectly fine. So it, it's kind of interesting how things have changed with appendicitis. So diverticulitis. There, it's a common illness, and as, as we all know, almost everybody has diverticula, and all, thankfully only about 5 to 10 percent are going to get sick from it. But that's still 3.2 million outpatients treated for diverticulitis, and that was in 2004, with nearly a million hospitalizations for diverticulitis. And the total cost to treat diverticulitis is $3 billion. To put that in perspective, the total cost to treat colorectal cancer in this country every year is only about $1.5 to $2 billion. So, Historically, we treated diverticulitis with antibiotics. This was not controversial. That was just what you did, except in Sweden. And in uh, 2012, they published a study where they took 623 patients with uncomplicated diverticulitis and they randomized them to antibiotics versus supportive care, whatever that is, clear liquids. And the interesting thing is that the complications happened in about 1% of patients on antibiotics and about 1.9% of patients without antibiotics, clearly statistically not significant. And the recurrence at one year was 16% in both groups. And except in Holland. I don't know what it is with Europe and trying to not give antibiotics, but they're, they're, really, they're really the leaders in that. Anyway, and in Holland, there's another randomized study with 528 patients with uncomplicated diverticulitis randomized to antibiotics versus observation. 
And the median recovery time was 12 days for antibiotics, 14 days for observation with no significant differences in complications, recurrence, resection, readmission, or mortality. And those are the sources. Um, so, shockingly, in the United States, fairly minimal data. But there is uh, the AGA, the American Gastro Gastroenterologic Association, suggests that antibiotics should be used selectively rather than routinely in patients with acute uncomplicated diverticulitis. The interesting thing is, of course, they did not actually define what selectively meant. So you can all kind of take your choice there. Personally, I think patients pretty much self-select based on their own biases and their willingness or stubbornness in terms of seeking medical care. I think it's pretty clear that most people who go to the trouble to see their doctor about their diverticulitis are probably going to get antibiotics. And those who are like, I don't want to see a doctor or I hate the antibiotics, they are, they, they will get, they simply get better. So it's very, very interesting to, uh, to, and I, I'll be honest, I am really a little bit skittish about if somebody makes it to me and they have diverticulitis and it's confirmed on a CT scan or if they've had it confirmed in the past and they say I have my same symptoms, I'm a little skittish about saying, okay, you'll feel better in a few days. Um, I'm curious, there's a fair number of practitioners here who probably see a lot of diverticulitis. Anybody have much experience with not treating patients with antibiotics who actively come for advice and counsel? Do well, you want to comment? I tell them to give it a few days, and if they're not better, then I say we should switch to antibiotics. Okay. I've got the default of where you give them antibiotics and they hate Cipro and Flagyl, it makes them sick and so they don't take it. Yeah. And usually they don't end up in the hospital or they Yeah. Interesting. You know, it's funny you should say that because I was speaking to a patient just this morning who was seeing me because she's had multiple attacks of diverticulitis in the last couple of months. And she said that she'd been through two courses of antibiotics. She specifically said how much she hated Flagyl, and which, what everybody says. And in addition, but it had been, and Augmentin gave her diarrhea, and she felt like her symptoms had been coming back, and she called her doctor, and she had, a prescription, had gotten a prescription for, I think, Cipro and Flagyl. And she said, you know what, I didn't even take it because I hate the flagell so much. And she said, in a few days I just got better. I'm like, great, you've just done your own personal randomized trial. <laughs> and so anyway, I, I think it's, it's interesting and probably there are a lot of patients out there who my guess is probably just stick it out at home and, and they just get better. So anyway, we'll talk more about diver diverticulitis in a minute. Yeah. See, the problem is, is that if they're, if they're seeing me personally, then they're probably, if, if they're in my clinic, then I don't have a white count, and I'm not going to draw one. And, but if they're in the emergency department, or if they have a white count, they probably, it's because they're in the emergency department, and therefore, they're much more likely to get treated just because they're in an emergency department. So I'm not aware of any data that, like I say, the AGA just says selective, and I think, in my mind, if you don't have an abscess, then it's uncomplicated diverticulitis. And so I think that's at least a starting point. If, if there's no abscess and they're, otherwise, and they're, not, you know, they're not super sick, I, I'm not sure how much white count would add to that or subtract from that, but that's, that's my thought. That's probably not very helpful. So shifting gears. Um, the, how about abdominal infections with sepsis? Did I go forward too far? Nope, I didn't. Okay. All right. So we all know that source control of abdominal sepsis is key, and antibiotics are obviously important. But the question has been out there for years, if not, well, probably decades, how long should the antibiotics last? And there is a really important trial, and I should say, you know, you can go back once again to your residency or to whatever, and, and antibiotic duration recommendations are all over the place. 
And you know, it's one week, is it two weeks, is it four weeks? How long do patients actually take antibiotics? All of that is, it's, we have very little data on it. So there was a trial done in, it was written up in 2015 called the Stop It Trial, the Study to Optimize Peritoneal Infection Therapy. And the, it was retrospective, at least initially retrospective, and they kind of divided the group up into patients who had less than seven days and more than seven days of antibiotics. And so the less than seven days had an average of about four days, and the more than seven days had an average of about eight days. And these were patients in which source control had been obtained meaning that their perforated colon had been removed or their abscess had been drained, so they had good source control. And what they found in the study was that the patients, or the patient with a shorter duration, the, the outcomes were the same as those who had a longer duration. So what about patients who are frankly septic? They don't, they don't just have an abscess, but they meet sepsis criteria. Well, here's a, a, a study, a, a follow-up study using the same set of data where they randomized septic patients with intra-abdominal infections to four days, the short co course, versus up to 10 days of antibiotics. Once again, there was no difference in outcomes between short and long course antimicrobial therapy in patients with complicated intra-abdominal infection presenting with sepsis, meaning they met sepsis criteria. Okay, well, what if the patient is bacteremic? You have a positive blood culture. And this is an article about optimal antibiotic duration for bloodstream infections, and this was not from the Stop It database. This is from a different group, and it's a retrospective, retrospective cohort of only 42 patients, so it's a small group, but they looked at less than seven days versus greater than seven days, and there was absolutely no difference in outcomes. And these were patients who were, who were frankly bacteremic. Well, what if the patient is critically ill? And this was a, another study, and this was in surgical ICU patients. And once again, the short, they, they divide them into short course versus long course, the short course being five days and the long course being 14 days. And the conclusion was, in critically ill surgical patients with complicated intra-abdominal infections, and so they're in the ICU, they've met sepsis criteria, they've got complicated in infections, a short duration of antimicrobial therapy after source control, and I have to really emphasize that we're not talking about patients who don't have source control, resulted in similar outcomes to previously published studies, providing support for the safety of this approach. And, another, and this was from the Stop It trial, um, my final point down there. They identified patients who were at high risk for treatment failure, failure including Apache score greater than five, corticosteroid use, colonic source, and such patients did not benefit from a longer course of antibiotic administration. Finally, what if it's a fungal infection? And I know that fungus kind of scares us. And so this was also from the Stop It database. And it, patients with intra-abdominal infection involving fungal organisms randomized to a shorter course of antimicrobial therapy had no difference in the rate of treatment failure compared to longer courses of uh, antimicrobial therapy. So it still doesn't tell you exactly how long these patients should be on antibiotics, but I think it really lends credence to the fact that we can probably give fewer antibiotics than we're doing. And I've seen a number of, of at least reasonable articles that talk about, for example, if somebody has perforated diverticulitis, that you can give antibiotics while they're in the hospital, but they don't need anything more to go home. And so they're probably in the hospital three or four days, they don't have to go home on anything. Um, and so, in fact, I'm sorry, for, specifically about diverticular abscesses, that um, treatment, with ab, with treatment of abscesses less than three centimeters were adequate with antibiotics alone, presumably short course, um, but about 25% had recurrent diverticulitis and long-term follow-up. 
and percutaneously drained abdominal abscesses of all kinds, they, once again, looking at uh, short course versus long course, and the bottom there, there was no difference in outcome between a shorter and longer duration of antimicrobial therapy in those with percutaneously drained source control of complicated intra-abdominal infections. So whether the source control was achieved by surgery or by percutaneous drainage, in either case, a shorter course of antibiotics was acceptable. So no one knows the best exact treatment course length for abdominal infections in terms of antibiotics. But there's really good data to suggest that a short course is adequate. So after going through all of this and thinking that perhaps I should probably make some kind of, I don't know, slightly intelligent recommendation, these are some of my thoughts. There's very good data, uncomplicated appendicitis, a single preoperative dose is, is definitely adequate. Now, if they choose to just do antibiotics, that's a different story. But for, just, for surgical, uncomplicated appendicitis, one dose is all they need. The same is true for uncomplicated cholecystitis. In fact, you can make the argument they don't, may not need a dose at all. But a single preoperative dose is certainly fine. For uncomplicated traumatic enteric perforation, primarily from trauma, um, either penetrating or blunt, there's very good data to show that you just need 24 hours of perioperative prophylactic antibiotics like you would for any elective surgery. If there's been a significant delay in treatment and so peritonitis is well established, then they probably fall out of that category. But if you get stabbed or shot and you're in the operating room within a couple of hours, then you just need the 24 hours of perioperative prophylactic antibiotics. For complicated appendicitis, a perforation or a small abscess that you find while you're operating, those data are all over the place, and, but those patients usually go home within a day or two, and probably no more than five days of antibiotics is plenty, and I suspect that less is probably just as good, but that's kind of my thought. And besides, everybody here who's a parent knows how hard it is to get their kids to take their antibiotics after about four or five days. Um, unless you're my parents. And, but the, uh, so probably most of these kids or people are getting five or fewer days of antibiotics anyway. So surgical source control, meaning perforated ulcer or colon or something along those lines, you can stop the antibiotics when the patient leaves the hospital or by seven days at the latest, whichever is less. And if you have endoscopic or percutaneous source control, once again, you should be able to stop the antibiotics when the patient leaves the hospital or by seven days. It's always a little bit of a, once again, a conundrum. If the patient has, say, a diverticular abscess and they have a drain in place and they're getting ready to go home, but the drain still looks a little bit purulent. It's not putting out very much, but it's looking a little bit purulent and you're like, well, do I need a few more days of antibiotics? The answer might be maybe. In all due respect to my interventional radiology colleagues, at least one of whom is here, um, one could argue that surgically removing the infection might be a little bit better controlled than just percutaneously draining the infection. Probably not much different though. So in any case, even if there's a little bit of purulence left in that drain, you can probably get away with a short course of antibiotics. Certainly the data would suggest that. So for whatever it's worth, those are my best thoughts on less is more with antibiotics and abdominal infections. I want to switch gears a little bit, and unless somebody has a particular question about that aspect, and talk about, yeah, fire away. Yeah. Well, I would start the clock when the diagnosis is made. But hopefully the drain goes in pretty quickly thereafter. It all depends on whether James is in a good mood or a bad mood. <laughs> no, I think I, I, the data would really suggest that once you've made the diagnosis, or at least once you've got control, you, at most you need a few days after that. <laughs> 
So, oh yeah. It can be. <laughs> no, go ahead, because I'm going to change topics a bit. Is the surgical force control, was that including like septic patients? Is that yes. The, uh, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. According to the stop at trial, it really is, yeah. Yeah. So if you have a, a case where you can't get the full source control through, you've got abdominal, say, liver or blood loss or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And liver abscess in particular, I think, is a completely uh, different, uh, a, a different thing because the problem with liver abscesses is, is that there's always, there, there's some pus there and you can drain that, but then there's always surrounding tissue, which on the CAT scan looks awful and looks like a sponge with, it's got air pockets, it, I mean, it looks like stool in the liver. And it, it just doesn't drain very well. And I think those patients benefit from a much longer course of antibiotics. And I, I know you, if you talk to infectious disease or hepatology, they'll give those patients two weeks, four weeks of antibiotics, even with the drain, even, even after the drains come out. Because oftentimes the drains will stop working after a short time, but you still got this devitalized liver tissue. And I think that's a, cl a completely different situation because it takes a long time to truly have control. Yeah, and I can't tell you for sure how many of the patients in the, like the stop at trial had pancreatic abscesses. So I, I, but my experience for whatever it's worth is, and certainly with pancreatitis, we've, we've also dramatically decreased the antibiotics that we use. I mean, it used to be standard practice that if you had necrotizing pancreatitis, you got prophylactic antibiotics. And now we know that there's no benefit to that. And as long as the necrosis is sterile, um, there really is no benefit. The problem is if once you get an, a pancreatic abscess and you can drain that, but once again you have the same problem of devitalized tissue and you're waiting for the patient to either get well enough or for enough time to pass where you can do a good surgical debridement. And my guess is that those patients cer certainly don't fall into this category. Um, they may well, they may, not necessarily need weeks of antibiotics, but I don't think they're in this category. I think once you've got devitalized tissue, then we all get a little bit scared about truncating their antibiotics. That's it, I, and I have not reviewed the data specifically on that in terms of antibiotic duration. It, it would be interesting to look. Well, one of the, the abdominal infection that I personally hate the most because I hate causing abdominal infections is anastomotic leak. And in today's world, anastomotic leaks still happen. And I was just reading recently about uh, Theodore Billroth, the famous Swiss surgeon who did the first gastric resection and after whom Billroth I and Billroth II anastomoses were named. He did the first gastric resection anastomosis in 1881. And I suspect that since then, the uh, the leak rate from anastomoses has, has always been present and as good as we are with being able to resuscitate the patients better and better antibiotics and all those things, we still see leak rates. And it doesn't, and you can look at a bunch of papers and colonic leak rates are between four and 8%. And they're higher if you're doing rectal surgery. They're even higher if, you've, if you had preoperative radiation. And I've, I've told my son on more than one occasion, who's a biomedical engineer, that if he can figure out how to eliminate anastomotic leak rates by some engineering thing, that he would be set for life. And I would hope that I would get a few percentages, a few percentage points just for coming up with the idea. But anyway, but there's some interesting things that we've learned about anastomotic leak. One is smoking. And you would think this would be obvious, but I can tell you that I went through eight years of residency at a prominent medical center back east, and nobody ever talked about smoking and anastomotic leaks. And yet there's really good data, and you can see Vanderbilt in 2015, they looked at 246 patients with left, a left colectomy. The overall leak rate was about 6.5%, which is right exactly typical. Non-smokers, 5%. Smokers triple, 
And in New Zealand, they studied 233 patients with rectal cancers. Those are, more, those are higher risk in anastomoses. The overall leak rate is 14%, but smoking was a more important risk factor for leaks in that patient population than having metastatic disease. Um, it's kind of interesting, and I tell my patients flat out, if, if it's not an emergency, but we're looking to do a colon resection for diverticular disease or even for cancer, I said, you've got to stop smoking because otherwise it's triple the chance of wearing a colostomy bag. And I often will remind them of what we would hear in the emergency department at Johns Hopkins in the middle of the night. Somebody has been shot and is going to the operating room, and we would tell them, you know, if your colon's been hit, you're probably, you may well need a colostomy. And, their last words before going off to sleep were often something along the lines of, Doc, Doc, chicks don't dig the bag. So anyway, try to, try to say the same thing to, to, um, to patients facing colon surgery. You get them to stop smoking, you've really helped the process. If you look at uh, the NISQIP data, which is the National Surgical Quality Improvement Project, this was a study done about 10 years ago, but over 13,000 patients, the leak rate 3.8%. And they showed that risk factors for leaks, including being male, using steroids, smoking, once again, uh, operative time, and having had chemotherapy. And so you can see there's a number of modifiable risk factors for trying to, trying to prevent an anastomotic leak. And the final one there is a busy slide, but it includes things like um, in, in, inadequate timing of the preoperative antibiotics, or using an epidural catheter, interestingly, were all associated with higher leak rates. Obesity. This is a, a meta-analysis published just within just this year, a meta-analysis of almost 33,000 patients. The findings of this analysis confirm that obesity significantly increased the risk of anastomotic leak, 25 to 28 percent greater risk and particularly in a rectal anastomosis, in other words, if they've got a rectal cancer. And they mention both the technical difficulties of the surgery, which is certainly true, but also metabolic and immunologic factors. It's no surprise that leak rates and infections after colectomy and wound infections are monitored very, very closely by government entities and insurance companies and individual um, hospitals or healthcare systems, and we've learned that there are a number of things that uh, that we can modify. And most hospitals now, and McKay definitely has a dedicated hyperglycemia team. And if a patient is a diabetic, they you can and their blood sugars, or even if they're not, but their blood sugars are higher than they should be, you can get the hyperglycemia team to manage the hyperglycemia, which. Is, is, is a big help. The, they started with cardiac surgery patients, but pretty much anybody now, and particularly colon patients, we've got teams to manage their hyperglycemia. We've moved away from using epidural catheters for pain control, which were nice in terms of decreasing narcotics, but now, but they had a lot of problems with hypotension and, and, and so on. And so now we do tap blocks, and both at McKay and at Ogden Regional, the anesthesiologists have become very skilled after the patient goes to sleep, of injecting long-acting uh, bupivacaine into the rectus sheath and around the sheath to block the nerves going to the, to the abdomen or to the abdominal wall, and you can get 24 to 36 hours of really good analgesia with this tap block, and you're decreasing narcotics and also not using epidurals. Prophylactic antibiotic timing is very closely watched, and the I remember once <laughs> had a trauma patient and unstable into the OR, had multiple injuries, including a colon wound, and um, took out the colon, and we didn't give any antibiotics until either the middle of the case or after the case, which technically was an oversight. And getting a letter from some regulatory office in the hospital saying, so what about the antibiotics? And, of course, my prideful self was like, you know, we were trying to save the patient's life, but the truth is that even in that situation, timing of antibiotics matters. So we're, we're, we're trying to get better at all of these things. 
Let's see. What about other comments? I want to make sure I don't. I, I thought I, you might be done early, but I've had way too much fun telling all these stories. So this is a total aside. It, it's if I would tell my students, okay, this won't be on your test. But I came across this as I was researching this talk, and I thought, this is kind of interesting, that inflammatory bowel disease patients have a much higher incidence of previous abdominal infections or enteric infections with Salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter, Clostridium difficile, and this was, and norovirus too, which is interesting considering how common norovirus is. So I don't know what to do with that data. I presented it because I thought, that's kind of interesting. I'm just going to share that. I guess maybe the take home message there is that, that what? Steroids. Steroids. That anyway, viruses matter. Um, but I wanted to skip ahead to, or finish off with this, with my, my ode to COVID-19. I know that everybody thinks that it's the pulmonologists and especially the intensivists, and kudos to the intensivists, and the hospitalists and the family practice physicians who are helping out on the hospitalist services. And you can't say enough things about the nurses and the respiratory therapists and the ER physicians that have all been at the forefront of the pandemic. And quite frankly, I've occasionally felt guilty because my workload, if anything, I've even had a few weeks where I didn't work that hard. And in fact, speaking of anecdotes, yeah, we got time for one anecdote. So the, <laughs> I read a paper, this is way off topic, but what the heck. Uh, I read a paper and it was written by a plastic surgeon who had talked about the going back to work after basically doing no surgery for a couple of months when the pandemic opened. And she wrote about the fact that she learned that she really liked having time off and she totally modified her schedule to, uh, to do less surgery and have more time off when she went back to work. So one day when my family was gathered, I said, hey, you know, I read this interesting paper about this plastic surgeon who was now taking more time off after, after the uh, coming, going back to work after the pandemic. And, and I just was kind of wondering, you know, maybe I'm missing the boat. Maybe I should be taking more time off. And there was this long silence. And finally, one of my children said, yeah, dad, I don't know exactly what you would do otherwise. <laughs> and so I think the message was pretty clear that they just wanted me to go back to work. So anyway, my, but the bottom line is, is that, that um, I finally found a COVID thing that directly impacts me. So I, I, my guilt is kind of, is much better now, but you can't say enough good things about those who have truly been working on the front line. So this is an interesting CAT scan, and most of you have probably already figured out that that huge amount of black there on the anterior abdominal wall is not supposed to be there. And that is what we call free air, which everybody knows is definitely not free. But this is a patient who has had COVID disease for a long time, is in the intensive care unit, and was actually beginning to turn the corner on their COVID uh, symptoms. And then they get an x-ray that looks like this. And you can see that the, the colon and the small intestine are very dilated. And what had happened is there was a, um, a perforation of the cecum. I took this patient to the operating room, removed their cecum, did um, an ileostomy. And the patient, unfortunately, still passed away a few days later. It was obviously the patient was not well to begin with. But it's interesting because I've, I've done a little bit of a literature search, and obviously we know that COVID is known for its pulmonary symptoms and occasionally gets some abdominal symptoms, and it can even be found in stool specimens. But there have been case reports of bowel perforation in the literature and around the world. I mean, Italy, M Myanmar, Spain, and so on and so forth. And I know that there's more than that out there because there's been two cases here in Ogden that I personally know of. And it's predominantly the right colon, and it's predominantly fatal, both the cases here as well as the cases that are reported. And we all wonder, is it because of, you know, microembolisms from the hypercoagulable part of COVID, perhaps? 
Is it because they're on steroids, which is obviously a risk factor for colon perforation? Is it because they are just physiologically compromised and get a profound ileus with then colonic dilation? And perhaps it's just a combination of all those things that becomes a perfect storm in, in a small but significant number of patients. Anyway, it's something to, uh, to at least think about in critically ill COVID patients whose GI tracts suddenly stop working. I can hear a storm just started outside. That's kind of interesting. Well, I do have a few hopefully cogent conclusions and recommendations. Perhaps the most important one is this. If you are the king of a country oppressing another country, be sure that your security procedures take into account the unorthodox sword concealment of left-handed visitors. I don't want anybody to forget that. Secondly, diverting the fecal stream to obtain source control is not always necessary, but has a very strong track record dating back centuries. Uncomplicated appendicitis can be treated successfully with antibiotics, but recurrence rates are high and patient expectations definitely limit this practice, especially in this country. Surgically treated uncomplicated appendicitis and cholecystitis require no more than a preoperative dose of antibiotics. There is no benefit to antibiotic administration and uncomplicated diverticulitis in terms of complications or recurrence. Managing patient expectations can be challenging in this situation. Diverticular abscesses should be percutaneously drained if greater than three to four centimeters, but antibiotic therapy alone is adequate for abscesses less than three centimeters. Recurrence rates for diverticulitis after having an abscess are high and elective surgery should be considered. Not mandatory, but at least considered. After adequate percutaneous drainage of a diverticular abscess or other abdominal abscess, a short course of antibiotics, probably less than five days, is appropriate. Assuming definitive source control, intra-abdominal infection by itself or in association with sepsis, bacteremia, fungal infection, or critical illness does not in and of itself indicate a need for a long course of antibiotics. Once source control is achieved, antibiotics can be stopped at hospital discharge or by seven days, whichever is shorter. Smoking, obesity, hyperglycemia, perioperative pain management, and perioperative antibiotic administration are modifiable risk factors for anastomotic leak and can be modified by better systems and by patient counseling at the individual practitioner level. And abdominal perforation is yet another way that COVID-19 can be lethal. Thank you for paying attention to all my stories and have a good evening.